there will be no real non-controlled currency in the world. We're coming for you, banks. Bitcoin is punk rock. Deal with it. You split, we bankrupt you. So do you use like you want to pay for things or not? No. Bitcoin Cash would be seen as more of a threat to the United States hegemony than Bitcoin. Miles Town, what's your favorite kind of money? Um, Bitcoin Cash. Hello and welcome back to the Bitcoin Cash podcast, following Bitcoin Cash on its rise to global reserve currency. This is episode number 65, the Bitcoin Cash uh, Conference 2022 review and crypto politics featuring special guests and first uh, member of parliament ever on the show, first political figure, uh, Rolando Bryson. Today is Monday, the 14th of November, 2022. I'm live in uh saint kitts jet is producing the show we've even got a live audience as well too which is a bit of a bit of a first for the show <laughs> Stop. Cue, cue, cue the applause uh and yeah our guest today is a uh politician a, a crypto currency advocate mm-hmm. and uh, a world leader in the space being the first to accept uh salary entirely in bitcoin cash as a representative of the people. So welcome to the show, MP Bryson. How do you get into uh, Bitcoin and introduce yourself? Oh, well, um, yeah, like I think everyone listening right now has, has um, heard about me a little bit. I really, um, I'm a member of parliament in St. Martin and like I, I came in my presentation, um, I, came, I come from a family in banking. You know, my dad was the managing director of one of the largest banks in the, in the country. Um, but you have to imagine he was in the banking sector where you had a population of like three or four thousand people at the time. So you, a bank was just about you know facilitating people, you know, a, a place where they can put their money, um, save it, save it responsibly. You can have a banker like my dad would tell you, okay, if you want to be able to maybe uh, expand your home a bit, this is how we can help you. This is the rates we can give you. It was about helping people. And around the, the late '90s, my dad actually after 25 years of service in the banking sector, had an early retirement. He could have worked for another 10 years, but he retired because he just didn't like the direction that the banking sector was going. And at the time, I'm, I'm a teenager, and I'm hearing him come home talking about these things, and I'm like, you know, wow, this is, this is sad. You know, that even my dad, who loved banking so much, his whole view on it, the fact that it's changing to a fee structure, the abuse of the fractional reserve system. Even as a teenager, I'm hearing all these terms because he's coming home inventing to my uncle and my, my dad and, and others as well. So uh, I've always had a view that, you know, why can't banking go back to what it was, you know, what it should be for, for the people? And that's when I started to look at cryptocurrency because then I saw, wait a minute, read this Satoshi white paper and you, you get used to what cryptocurrency is. And well... I guess we, we kind of have to give up on the banking system. It's, it's never going to go back to what, let's say, we had it like in St. Martin or maybe what it might have been in the 1800s when banking you know, in, in the United States first came about with the greenback, etc., you know, a non-central currency. That, those days are over. So the only possible solution had to be cryptocurrency. So when I got elected in 2018, I immediately started doing research on it. And I questioned my central bank about it. I said, okay, what's your view? What's your position on, on, on cryptocurrencies? What, are you, what do you want to do? What is your vision? How are you going to advise uh, the parliament and the government? Because they're, it's an independent entity in the, in the country. Um, but we do have oversight over them via our Minister of Finance. And they came out with a one-page memo just basically saying, well, we don't have any oversight of cryptocurrency because it's not a security, it's not a, a tender. So basically, we suggest you do KYC, but we're not getting involved. And I found that was very weak of them, very um, nonchalant. You know, I think it, it, back then already we could have started, you know, innovating and, and reaching out to different people within the communities to see which, which cryptocurrency would best fit the needs of St. Martin, you know. So then I said, well, if I can't depend on the central bank, I have to do it myself. And I kept researching about it. Of course, I would start with Bitcoin and say, okay, is Bitcoin, does it work for us and stuff? And I quickly learned that Bitcoin is not going to solve the problem of not just St. Martin's, but the entire Caribbean, which is we need fast, cheap ways to remit money peer-to-peer. We don't have PayPal. 
we don't have cash app wire transfers are extremely expensive and very long sometimes just for me to wire transfer to someone right there in miami that's a three-hour flight away can take a week and it can cost a hundred dollars to send five hundred dollars um so the caribbean just to give a little background on that as well in the 70s and 80s the caribbean was the world leader in offshore banking and my theory is that the world did not like that that was too much power for a, a region that was mostly of uh, comprised of independent afro-caribbean uh people of african descent the world could not accept that the cayman island saint martin the bvi and and barbados and all of us everyone was bringing their money to the caribbean so they invented this thing called the FATF, the Financial Action Task Force, because we need to make sure that there's no money laundering and terrorism financing going on in the Caribbean. Like, really? No, people were just tired of the banking system that Europe and the United States were creating and saw that the style of banking in the Caribbean like, was what my dad did. It was just a place to come and deposit your money, um, help some people get some work in the banking sector. No one was becoming millionaires in the Caribbean in the banking sector. Every banker in the Caribbean did it for love, and that was extremely attractive. That's why billions of dollars are flowing, and they completely killed that. And I said, I am not going to allow, as long as I have any sort of political influence, that not just St. Martin, but that the Caribbean loses out on another opportunity to be that again. The Caribbean has a potential, just like in the 70s and 80s, we were the offshore banking capital of the world, the Caribbean really does have that potential because we, our culture, you guys have seen it. We're very open-minded. We're very relaxed. You know, everyone wants to make money, but that's not the ambition. People want to be happy. You know, they want to live well. They want to interact and we're a tourism destination. So we're used to interacting with people of so many cultures. If you think about it like that, we're the perfect place to be the financial sector. And coupled with that, we have the most need than anywhere in the world for cryptocurrency. So um, I'm happy to maybe be a sort of pioneer in the political arena for it. Um, but what we quickly see is that other countries are now coming on board. You know, uh, we saw the amazing announcement from the prime minister here about legal tender. Um, we saw that uh, despite it being a, a, not BCH, um, but Dominica adopted Tron. I think that's a great thing, even for BCH, because the fact that that countries are at least adopting something. It opens the door for them to make the comparison and say, well, you know, well, we adopted Bitcoin, we adopted Tron, but take a look at what St. Martin and St. Kitts is doing. They're contacting us, you know, Dominica's contacting us, and even people from the Tron community are contacting us to say, well, maybe we're more on the tech side of things and you guys can be the more the remittance currency. So you're seeing Dominica itself is already kind of like, well, we did adopt this, but this BCH thing looks interesting. So we just need people, the, you know, the BCH community is a few steps ahead of us. You know, we're very layman in this field. We just want solutions that you guys have. And it's great that you're bringing it to the Caribbean and opening our eyes. Uh, I would say don't underestimate the size and impact of the Caribbean. We're 60 million people strong. There are not many countries that have a population of 60 million. And the more this is happening, the advantage that BCH has is that uh, it, it's the perfect solution for so many problems, so many problems, remittances, banking issues, non-banking. Um, and that's the advantage you have is that you're here first, but you also happen to be the best. <laughs> I'm very glad to hear to hear you say that. So I'm curious then, uh, you said in 2018 you got elected and obviously you had the financial and the banking aspects uh, growing up. So where did politics come into things? Did you start in the political oh. industry or were you you're doing some other stuff beforehand? No, no actually, um, I, I always kind of thought maybe one day I would go into politics, but I always envisioned that being like something I would do like, towards the end of my career, like in my 50s or something. Uh, my passion is actually tourism. Um, I, I remember in high school um, that uh, I wanted to be a lawyer at the time. And now I actually am studying law as well. Um, but I want to be a lawyer. And then this politician came to, to my high school. His name is Tio Heiliger. He's actually the founder of the party that I'm now the leader of. And uh, he came to that school and he was at the time the minister of tourism. 
and he was just talking about tourism and he made an analogy that you know all of you who get like one dollar from your parents to come and buy something in the canteen to eat do you know where that dollar came from it came from tourism and it just was like mind-blowing like yeah we never thought about why are we where did these dollars come from we don't have a federal reserve office here it's all just coming in from tourists so i got immediately fascinated by the tourism industry and what that does for people because then i started to do some research about it and look at um, other countries and see how dependent we are on the fact that you all are here. Um, you've bought airline tickets, you've paid for hotels, you've gone out to eat. Um, so the tourism industry became an immediate passion for me. So I studied tourism in Amsterdam in college. And when I returned to St. Martin, I worked at an airline. And then uh, there was a position that opened for uh, the St. Martin Tourism Authority to be the director. And that actually was my first indirect foray into politics because at the time, um, there were some political forces that did not want me to be the tourism director. They already, naive me, thought that it would be based on merit and skill. Um, I scored the highest in all the interviews, but there were some political forces that didn't want me there because who's this kid? We can't control him. We, can, we can't have someone in such a powerful position. So I got really publicly attacked. You know, I was accused of embezzling money and um, I'm irresponsible. All kinds of accusations came my way and I hit a complete huge depression. And for two weeks, I didn't leave my home. I was so devastated. I was thinking about moving back to the Netherlands. Um, but there was another local politician and a very close friend of mine that came to me and said, Rolando, people would not attack you if they don't think you're a threat to the status quo. So you have to generate what we call to this day the turtle back. It's an evolution of where a lizard used to crawl on the ground and would get eaten. And over millions of years, that lizard evolved a turtle back over its shell where it knows that when the attack is coming nothing can hit it because it all bounces off and ever since then it completely changed my life and and then I start to see okay why did this go wrong because we have bad politicians that want to keep especially the next generation of politicians in my island out and uh, I did eventually still become the tourism director because I persevered and most people in my country, I think, all would say I did an amazing job. I, I really did a lot for tourism in the country. And in 2017, we got hit by a hurricane. And I was the face of the country because I was talking to CNN and doing interviews and, and really blew up then. And then there was an election and everyone felt like, you know, we liked you as tourism director, but you should be the face of the country. So you should go into politics. And I got elected in 2018, re-elected in 2020. And um, yeah, it's it's been a good ride. Yeah. What strikes me about that story is that there's kind of three layers of uh, it's like a microcosm, your individual experience of being attacked with sort of lies yeah. and stories and, uh, you know, mistruths and so on and so forth mm -hmm. is then a little microcosm of the Caribbean at large that you were mm -hmm. talking about, the sort of forces arrayed against yeah, it yeah. that happened there. And then interestingly, like Bitcoin Cash has had it's a very now. similar similar story, right? With the censorship and the propaganda oh, and yeah. all of that. So is, do you think that's something that draws you to this community in particular? Uh, you know, it's it's funny because when, when I see that, I'm like, oh, this is child's play. This is, <laughs> this, this, come on, guys. You want to troll me? Come on. You got to come stronger than that. You know, like... Uh, oh, you, that's a scam or this and that. It's like I've been hearing those type of things all my life about things I do and my rule has always been my work will speak for itself. So if I believe something is good for my people, the work that I do for it will ultimately speak for itself. So don't worry too much about what people have to say. You do have to educate. you know, And that's why I said in the presentation as well that um, we could bring legal tender legislation to parliament tomorrow. Um, but I feel a responsibility to educate even the naysayers, even those that will, will no matter what, uh, I have a saying in, in, in Parliament that, you know, if Rolando Bryson did like Jesus and turn water into wine, I would be accused of trying to get the population drunk. You know, there's no <laughs> way I can win, yeah. you know. Um, but what I, what I feel is that I still have a responsibility to try and educate and let them see that this is truly decentralized. There is no magic person in the back controlling this or, or funding people or none of this. It's purely the most community-driven thing I've ever seen. I'm fascinated by that, you know. Um, and that, 
that easily counters what my, some trolls are doing. And, and you know what? I, I would have to say, I don't know if you guys have noticed, I feel like it's less than before. It's a lot less. And it might be a combination of things. It might be that we're undeterred, that you have such strong voices like the prime minister, myself. You have someone like Kim.com. You have all of these people that are starting to speak out that, guys, stop it. This thing is just technologically. Let's just forget the characters. Forget who's involved. Look at the technology. Is it good and does it have potential to change the world? That's undeniable. And then also um, the resiliency of, of everything, because while all the maxis and BTC, for example, are you know, houses are burning down and crying and panicking, we're just here calmly just working. You know, hey, no, no we know. Not your keys, not your coins. We're going to keep working. We're going to keep pushing. No one is, is, I don't see the motivation level in the community going down. I see it going up. Huh. You know, whereas other communities are devastated. Oh, I lost my coins in this exchange or whatever. And even we've had our own exchange problems and still people are building. Look at what General Protocol is, their presentation. You know, uh, 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 look what's happening with Zapit. Amazing stuff going on in what people would think is a super tumultuous time. It speaks to the resilience of Bitcoin Cash and the people that support it and love it and build. And I think that's also what separates us from a lot of others. And um, that's that's what we have to just keep the focus on work and building and whatever I can do to be a motivational voice and a, a, a public, you know, betting my political career on this is a bet I would I would always do a thousand times because I know we are on the right track. Yeah. yeah, well, it's certainly a community that is both, yeah, like you say, very resilient because pressure makes diamonds, as they say, that's right. We've been, been through a lot and. <laughs> On the other hand, it's also very ideologically motivated. Uh, you know, at the time of the split with BDC and BCH, they started at one to one, and at the bottom it was two hundred and five to one that we've we've seen so far. And so, if you take it that way, you know, you give somebody two hundred times more financial resources. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You got You got to give some props to the underdogs for fighting it out. And I think one of the great reasons for that is because the bch community measures itself on a completely different metric to almost every other currency that's right they look at it in terms of the price or maybe how much hype or media stories but the bitcoin cash community looks at it as how many people are educated on this stuff mm -hmm. how many people are transacting peer-to-peer -peer. they have not your keys not your coins they understand that and how many people are engaging with it in in commerce right buying a hamburger right that's the ultimate thing that the bitcoin cash community uh is uh striving for and you can you can see that happening around the island you can see the uh s stickers going up and you can see a little bit uh you know on saint kitts i've seen locals using it and transacting yeah. with each other not in great numbers yet yet and certainly uh the all the tourists coming in is helping to provide a, an economic incentive and a, yeah. and a boost but i have seen some open-mindedness to it here so for me that that's making a, a huge difference yeah really. yeah and you know i would venture to say based on what i've seen i mean i've been to el salvador i've uh, been to portugal uh, I'm, I'm in St. Martin and I've been to St. Kitts. I would challenge anyone to show me a country per capita that that has more cryptocurrency from a microtransaction perspective, peer to peer. To peer. I, I, it, it doesn't exist. Um, you know, in El Salvador, it, it, we, we know what the flaws are with that system. We know that a lot of the initial um, hype had to do with the fact that the government put you know, something in everyone's wallets and in a country where you're going to get $10, which can be, you know, a day's salary. Everyone's going to, going to spend it. Um, but here, people are generally accepting it. You know, you go to Buddha Bar. I went, had some hookah the other day. Um, that Chinese restaurant next door is great, by the way. Did you try that? Yes, oh, yes. We did so go in there, yes. They accept BCH, the hotel. Um, you go to, to Port Zante um, in the tourist area. You can buy souvenirs, T-shirts and stuff, several taxis. Um so that, that, is, that is a good uh, uh, case study for the fact that it can work. And I, I like that it works within the community as well, you know, that, that people are exchanging amongst one another, you know, and that's, that's really good. Um, I see what's happening in, in South Florida. Um, I see what's happening in Australia. And, yeah, it, it's working. And I don't think really on a practical level which other cryptocurrency 
is doing this per capita just just for for the for the size of the population that has adopted versus the number of transactions we definitely have the most adoption in the world i think yeah, yeah. being an industry leader is always hard you've got to uh, forge the way but on the other hand then other co coins can then uh, struggle to catch up once they realize they're they're behind the game and i think really putting ourselves to the metal means that when we saw in the conference there was some discussion about this isn't perfect and this isn't working and what if we need to do this differently and we need a solution to this and i don't know what we're going to do about this and that but those questions are being asked because we're at the coal face uh as my my dad would always say that i'm at the coal face and that's mm -hmm. exactly what it is when you're doing that that hard work you're going to get dirty and it's going to be be difficult but that's ultimately how you get results so speaking of that we always touch on the uh price very briefly sure. this week uh bitcoin cash is 103 dollars uh and 19 cents usd so that's down a little bit but it's up actually against uh btc 162.1 uh, yeah. bch to btc and also up against ethereum 12.18 bch to ethereum so i have said on this show many times that as we go through a bear market bch is a is a true survivor so as the prices crash it, and it gets to the bottom bch actually starts rising yeah. relatively uh because there is a real floor of utility and it's people who are not not going anywhere they're gonna stick it out so that's right how do you handle the volatility in the markets obviously taking your salary you might be interested in i don't know any hedge or how yeah. do you handle yeah volatility and speculation in, in cryptocurrency yeah well um it's it's definitely one of the more practical concerns and that's why at the conference you know you, you heard the the and, and i think it was the presentation with um go crypto where they were talking about kind of establishing that bridge between fiat and cryptocurrency um my personal belief is that we shouldn't think that it's an on off switch with, with regards to adoption there needs to be transition um when you do the adoption you still need to allow some time for merchants to get used to the fact that look step one it's a good fast cheap payment medium but allow them the the channel to still for now trade some either back into fiat or in a stable solution like any hedge because the fact is these are business people that have certain margins that they need to stick to and i think um now we see that the, the, the adopters are doing that working with what's happening at general protocols and so on to get that going we were hoping that any hedge will get on the bitcoin.com wallet soon um those solutions are necessary because um, it's, it's people that are new to the crypto space and that can get very anxious when they're seeing all this news, like you mentioned during the FTX collapse. People are going to get worried that, oh boy, is, does this mean that at the end of the month, instead of having $1,000 worth of, of, of coins to, to, you know, to buy products, maybe I have $900. Um, so we do need those solutions, but those solutions are there. Um, I think also uh, at some point, it will really shift to the point where it won't matter where because you're trading just bch to bch the dollar value will matter less and less because it's just a circular economy of um, i'm a supermarket and i buy rice from this supplier who buys his product from this other supplier um, who pays for his fuel and payroll and stuff all in bch so the price volatility will become a thing of the past um, but that's that we're, we're in that transition period still so we have to acknowledge as a community that solutions are needed to help merchants um, deal with that on a peer-to-peer -peer level it matters a lot less you know um, we 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 speak in BCH now you know like hey one send me one BCH or half a BCH we don't speak in well can you send me a hundred and six dollars in BCH you know I, I noticed that language happening more on the peer-to-peer -peer side of it but we do need merchants to have solutions yeah i've certainly seen last night actually we were we were at the casino we were trying to play some uh texas hold'em and we had a bit of a group there and i was talking to them about bitcoin they actually have the bitcoin uh, logo on their on the chips because yeah. they've been sponsored by bitcoin.com yeah so we were going there and we all had you know bitcoin uh, shirts and stuff like that so people were noticing it and we were talking to uh like one of the cashiers and the dealers and uh one thing she said to me was oh you know it's just money and uh, so I said, oh, can you accept uh, Bitcoin to buy into the table? And she said, uh, no, but 
you know, it, it shouldn't be that that big of a deal because yeah. it is just money. And there was that famous uh, ad that was made, it's just money, bro, in the Bitcoin Cash community. So yeah. she has never seen that, but the message is getting across here by there being so many signs of it's accepted at restaurants and stuff. People see it actually being traded and it's the complete opposite to any kind of investment narrative yeah, yeah, that yeah. you buy in and then <clears throat> hope that you're going to be rich and a bazillionaire in you know, five years or whatever, right? Yeah. And I think seeing the community get that get that idea has been has been absolutely massive. So, yeah, yeah let's talk about the conference. So, obviously, we've had the St. Kitts and Nevis um, BCH 2022 conference here uh, on Saturday, but before and after, there's been people, you know, hanging out and meeting mm-hmm. up. Obviously, it's been a showcase of the local adoption. For the most part, I'd say most of the attendees have been able to operate primarily on bch maybe not a hundred percent but certainly by strategic use of being at the hotel which accepts uh bch and uh preferring the local vendors that we get referred to i think people are doing that probably over 100 people uh in attendance uh internationally and then also a few locals right more than 30 countries represented um a lot of chat and uh people you know, uh, getting to know each other and so forth. How have you found the conference overall and what, um, what you expected? It was, as much as my expectations were so high, it was beyond my expectations um, because I can see that uh, very wisely there were some key announcements that no one knew was coming. I mean, zap it, shout out to, to you again for making that happen. Um, we've been hearing of any hedge, um, but... I really like that General Protocols, their presentation was really brought down to the layman's terms. And that was really good. That was very helpful because some of us that are not as tech savvy, we want to follow what's happening there, what's happening on that level. And in that presentation, I I had people in St. Martin that were watching the live stream and they're like, wow, I didn't know that that was technically possible. I didn't know that um, one of the best slides in the entire conference was when he showed, I think it was, it was John, um, showed all of the different faces of all of these different people that are just devs behind the scenes, just altruistically building. You know, you don't, that's, and, and you, you would think is that's, the, that could be a, a Fortune 100 company in Silicon Valley level of, of skill. But they're choosing that, no, nah, we're not going that route. You know, we could be working in a suit for Facebook or Google or whatever, but look at the quality and, uh, and size of the massive number of people that are building in this community. I was like, whoa, it's even more than I thought, you know, because you see the, 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 the faces of it, you know, like a John Yeary who's always out there and preaching and talking. But, man, we have an army, actually. And it was really a, a great revelation. I think that was um, one of the best things. I also found the citizenship by crypto to be very an interesting concept as well that... Um, the fact that a nation is is willing to now do what they would traditionally do, which was you know accept your fiat investment and allow you to become a citizen of the country, and that same nation is now saying no, you can also do that with BCH. Politically, that's that's huge. That's actually a huge announcement um, because it's going to open a, a new usage for this cryptocurrency. Because think about it: if someone does have 150,000 in BCH and wants to become a petition and decide to buy a house here for that money, um, that means that those funds are going to the government of the country. And what is the only viable thing for the government to do with that money is to reinvest it back into the society, which creates a new flow of, of, of that funds just going through. Like, okay, let's, let's now uh, build a school with that 150,000 that we just got. So what we're gonna do is pay 50,000 to this contractor and pay uh, 50,000 to this uh, hardware store to get all the material. And then they in turn, okay, we have this BCH. Well, I guess we'll pay our employees with it. Now what are employees are gonna do? Well, they're going to eat, you know? And, and so it, it's gonna create a circular economy in St. Kitts where all this BCH for in exchange for citizenship is gonna come in and it's gonna stay here. Because it's not like um, St. Kitts can pay foreign debt with BCH. It's not like they can say, hey, uh, IMF, that loan that we had, here's a, here's a down payment. They'll be like, wait, what? No, we don't accept this. Give me dollars. No, they're going to have to reinvest it. So imagine they get 100 people a year 
doing the citizenship by investment at 150,000, that's going to be 15 million in BCH transactions that's coming to a government that is now going to take that 15 million and reinvest it in the society. And that will truly create a huge circular economy. It's something that I'm also going to explore in St. Martin. Um, we, we can't do citizenship by investment, but we can do residency by investment. Um, I was already talking to Sonny, who's very familiar with it, and is going to help me build that in St. Martin, where we too um, can say, hey, if you want to have become a permanent resident of a, a country that's in the Dutch kingdom, which gives you rights to a Schengen visa, which gives you rights to our tax rates, um, it'll be cheaper, so it'll be like maybe $50,000. But again, imagine we get 100 people a year saying, oh, sure, I'll take 50000 in my BCH reserves and give that to St. Martin. I become a resident of St. Martin. And all of a sudden, all of this money, the only thing I can do as a government is reinvest it in my community. So it's, it's huge, a lot of huge, huge announcements. It, it blew me away, actually. I really didn't expect... Like, boom, boom. It was like a machine gun of, of announcements this whole trip. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, it was just the sort of the one-day conference and it was a pretty packed schedule. I mean, mm -hmm. we'll see. Maybe in 12 months, it'll be a two-day conference. And I, I but, definitely uh, predict it'll be more, yeah. Uh, yeah. But I think it's just about, you know, keeping it short and to the point and just, well, it's typical of BCH itself, just very crammed full of uh, content, you know. <laughs> yeah, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, uh, no frills. Yeah. Just and like, kind of like, uh, it was like an outlet as well, you know. Um, it's one thing to share your ideas on Telegram and on Twitter and so on. But what I also feel, it's like finally a platform was given to so many hardworking people to showcase what they do. It was an honorable moment. Uh, oh, sorry. It was an honorable moment for the community and for those people that have been working, the onboarders, the programmers, um, the citizenship by investment, people like Sonny and Roger and... Uh, myself, the Prime Minister, it was our stage to finally show, look guys, this is what we've been busy with and stay tuned, there's more. And I think next conference, um, if we had 100, over 100 at attendees, I think we're going to hit over five or 600 and then it's going to continue to grow. I, I truly predict, I mean, look in the group chats, what you see everyone saying is, damn it, I wish I went, I wish I went, I wish I went. <laughs> I think all Every single person that came this year is coming next year. That's for sure. Yes. So then sure. you're just going to have a multiplication. And people now understand you're on the world stage. I mean, Kim.com retweeted uh, myself and the prime minister's presentation. I don't know if you guys saw that. It has over 150,000 views, you know, over 1,000 retweets. This is a guy with a million followers at that and you, you over 300 comments. And you're reading the comments. People, of course, in between. That's why I said it's less. In between, you see the little laser eye bots here or there, but you really just see people like, wow, I need to check this out. Oh, this is interesting. Oh, it's only $100? Oh, I'll buy some now. So we're, this conference put us on a world stage. Yeah. yeah, and I think one of the interesting things you said about uh, money flowing into the economy by uh, you know the government investment programs and that, again that's sort of there's the big picture and there's the small picture it's the same as the fact that I've seen a lot of people here at the conference tipping you know waiting staff or taxi drivers or street vendors or whatever there's been a lot of that and because the BCH community will do it in the mm -hmm. way where they will give them some coins and they'll explain it to them and show them here's how to use it non-custodially and you know you need to back up your keys and so forth that means that because people are joining the economy peer to peer it's actually easier for them to spend it on yep. than to sell it yeah, because yeah. they would have to sign up find an exchange find out if it's trustworthy sign up put their coins in there blah 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 but that's more work than just uh, spending it at your local uh, that's right. shop right yeah, yeah 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 and so in that way we're seeing yeah i think we'll see a multiplicative uh, effect mm -hmm. uh, and then perhaps around the world as people realize this is going on they are already linked up with that giant infrastructure of all the exchanges and all the money that uh, flows through there the general protocols talk certainly has been the highlight in terms of the attendees here i think because i was asking people as i yeah, went yeah, around yeah. what was your favorite talk and by a landslide like, yeah yeah no, and that i was, agree that was the favorite I, and i agree um like i said i'm not a i'm not as technologically inclined but it was the most eye-opening of everything. It was the presentation that showed us how strong we can build. And 
uh, even let's say when I, I speak to people that followed online, yeah, I would say that was the best presentation. Yeah. And just a note from me then is that this uh, technology that they've made with any hedge is truly industry leading stuff. There is no other yeah. currency with anything <laughs> Nothing like, like it. it. And nor did it come about quickly, right? It was only possible because of the uh, protocol improvements that have been made over the last two years and even just coming to an agreement on adding those and blah, blah, blah in a decentralized economy itself has been a huge thing. So the Bitcoin Cash community, uh, sort of similar to the fact that it operates on its own metrics, is it operates on its own time frame. Mm -hmm. It's not looking for what is going to work in the next three weeks or how to get the latest buzz or hype yep. instead it, it we're playing the long game here that's and right like i say you know <laughs> global reserve currency whether that's a big project maybe it's going to take 20 years maybe but if you're planning for a 20 year time frame you don't make decisions today that's going to fuck things up that's right um then so one of the major announcements of course was also the legal tender mm -hmm. element that we had right at the end so uh dr terence drew who's the prime minister of saint kitts and nevis made an announcement that there'll be sort of an in official government investigation. He didn't actually go into too much detail what it uh, consisted of, but that essentially there would be a, I don't know, a panel or a research into Bitcoin Cash mining and legal tender with some kind of results or announcement or something by 2023, so that, uh, March 2023, so that there would be time for due diligence it's probably a matter of interpretation whether it was like we'll look into it and update yeah. you then or we're planning to have it uh done by then but then roger uh, cheekily asked uh, then are yeah. you racing uh, which one is going to be first you yeah. know saint martin or um uh you know or saint kitts so bitcoin cash is now in the arena competing to be one of only two cryptos that have uh have that going on as a legal tender yep. status what did you think about that announcement? And you said it kind of might be too early in March, but yes. 2023 is a, a time frame. How are things looking there? Yeah, um, I'm, I'm not surprised that St. Kitts is a bit ahead of us because also, um, remember in 2020, they also passed a general cryptocurrency legislation that actually um, set up infrastructure to be able to, um, you can open exchanges, you can open crypto-related companies here. So they, they have some of the basic legislation already drafted. Um, in our case, we have no legislation at all in St. Martin related to, to, to um, crypto at all. So our jump to legal tender is, is going to have to encompass both. We're going to have to legislate and define cryptocurrency, for example. In their legal system, that is defined. So you have to define it. it it's a bit of legal mumbo jumbo. Um, but I, I, I think that it's good. Like I mentioned earlier, the more countries that are looking at adopting anything, first of all, that's good. Um, the fact that St. Kitts and Nevis, and my prediction is that they will make it in March. Um, politically speaking, um, it's not something... Remember, there was a, another government that was in charge before this government recently got elected. And that government was pro-BCH and pro-crypto. Now, that government is now the opposition in government. How do they oppose something that when they were in office, they were vehemently for? I think actually what that would cause is a very united um, parliament in St. Kitts saying, whatever differences we have with this government, one thing we can agree on is B BCH legal tender. And I, I predict my personal prediction, um, this is not based on any inside information or anything, just looking at the political landscape, is that uh, the, the prime minister is doing the right thing, which is more for the population, due diligence, getting all the information and making sure that's part in the explanatory notes of his legislation. Um, but I do think March 2023, St. Kitts will be legal tender. And I do think in 2023, um, I would say using St. Kitts as a good example, we don't always have to be first, uh, but we can be a close second. Um, I think that will also help my parliament because a lot of the debate that might happen in the parliament of St. Kitts on this before they pass that legislation is something that my colleagues will also be looking at. Um, like I mentioned, in a parliamentary system, no one can pass a law on their own. I'm, I'm allowed to propose laws on my own, but I do need a broad support at, of a majority in parliament to, to pass it. Now, I have a coalition of, of broad support 
But I would love to see it unanimously pass. And maybe we'll get there. And with educating, with looking at what St. Kitts is doing, I think we'll get there in 2023. Yeah, it's absolutely amazing. And like yeah. you said, having those two um, options or two parallel streams yep. running, they play into each other because... I always think of there's this meme video of this one guy and he's dancing on a hill, right? Mm -hmm. And then a second guy comes over and starts dancing with him. Yeah, and, and then, then at that point it flows, everybody just piles in, right? right? So it's that second person that gives permission for everyone for else, everyone to, else follow, to come in, yeah. Follow in and that could be essentially the the pattern because we've seen like with El Salvador they adopted it and everybody was on edge and watching Waiting. and it didn't go really that well. Yeah. So there wasn't sort of a follow-up with yeah, with yeah. other ones. I mean, they've recently announced that some uh, small city in Switzerland, or I think, has made uh, legal tenant, but it's not on the national scale. It's it's yeah, a, yeah. a minor thing, and that, at that country level is, is such a big difference. You say you would like to get the unanimous agreement. I mean, I watched the uh, talks uh, when there was that live session yeah, of, the, yeah, yeah. of the parliament, and it was quite enlightening to see. There were certainly a couple of people who were very, very worried about that. Yes, yes. Uh, are things changing on that front? or No, like you, you have, in, in my parliament, the way I see it, you have um, three types of parliamentarians. You have those that truly um, are working and believing in the government that we support that is going to do the right thing by the people and that believe in me and believe in my legislative focus. You have then those that are um, genuinely skeptical. You have those that really feel like, you know, I don't know this stuff. It's really worrisome. That's a very minor group, maybe one or two. But then you have a group of about three or four people who just oppose just because they oppose. Like I said, if Rolando Bryson turns water into wine, they will accuse me of trying to get the population drunk. So um, I have to navigate those waters. A lot of what you saw in that meeting was the latter, where just because it's MP Bryson, uh, he's becoming a little too popular maybe, or they just don't like me or whatever, it's like if someone else brought it, let's say if they brought it, there would have been a whole different discussion on it. What's ironic, for example, one of the politicians that was, was, was speaking, um, Sarah Westcott Williams was the older lady who was speaking. Her minister, in the previous government, she appointed a minister of finance, Mr. Per Perry Kierlings. And he is absolutely pro-crypto. He's one of the people, he's no longer the minister of finance, but I talked to him almost on a weekly basis. Hey, what do you think about this? What do you think about that? And he's fully for it. And she took a stance, oh no, this is just money laundering, uh, this is all volatility, it's bad, we have to just stick to gold and fiat, the whole traditional speech. And then the day after that presentation or shortly after, he comes out with an article, a member of her party, completely refuting everything she said. So even within her own political party, there are people telling her, no, if you're gonna play politics with Bryson, or, or, or not want to follow his policies, go ahead, but not on this topic. So what's happening is some of their own party members and constituents are telling them, no, this is, this is good. Because if we want to talk regulation, and if we want to, to agree as, 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 a, as a community, what one form of regulation that's good for us, it's legal tender. It gives the proper status to it, 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 it um, allows, you know, like I call it, dumb contracts to now sync with smart contracts because now dumb contracts are written in legal tender. Smart contracts involve cryptocurrency. But by making legal tender, now both can be in sync. Someone can have a smart contract that is backed by a dumb contract on paper. Uh, that is important because if I want to buy a property in BCH, I can't go to a notary and say, hey, I'm buying this property for 10,000 BCH. The notary is going to look at me and say, what? what? What is that? That's like walking into a notary's office with a thousand apples and saying, hey, I'm buying that house for a thousand apples. And they say, no, no, no. Go and take those apples, sell them for $100,000, and then you can buy this property. But by making it legal tender, now someone can write, I am buying this property for 10,000 BCH. And then the notary notarizes it and... It's, it's a transaction. So legal tender gives that protection, um, allows more usage for it. Uh, it creates a clear tax line, which is, which is what um, both sides want. The government wants to be able to collect taxes from sales that are due to them. 
But the community doesn't want this treated as capital because of the fluctuations. It's unfair. They're making a risk. Why should I pay a capital gains tax on this? No, it's a currency, no capital gains tax. So we will pay you if we sell something and it's a 5% sales tax, we'll give you your 5%. But we won't give you a capital gains because that is our currency. Just like I don't, if the dollar goes up 100%, no one pays capital gains on that, do they? So that's where legal tender is the best and easiest um, regulation that solves a lot of regulatory problems. Um, and I think that's the, the main regulation that I would focus on. And then maybe you can start to look at things like, you know, what you're going to do about exchanges and stable coins and so on. But um, yeah, legal tender covers 90% of your regulatory problems. Yeah, and I wanted to ask, I know you probably may have to go in a, in a minute, but... Uh, uh, i got like 10 minutes. Uh, okay, all right. I wanted to ask you specifically about uh, at the conference, you actually got a question from your electorate. There was a Yeah, yeah, that was really interesting. Yeah. yeah, and she said, I'm from St. Martin, and I have a question for Envy Bryson. And uh, her question was about e-commerce. And yeah. she was clearly trying to sell things online and do transactions. And she was asking how Bitcoin Cash fits into that. So I was wondering if you could speak to the feedback you get on the ground mm -hmm. from people around this stuff. Like you said, you know, it's already seems to be quite... Uh, popular but uh yeah just talk to me about yeah. that what a, what a, what a st martin constituents tell yeah. you about bitcoin cash or about crypto or your stances on that yeah so st martin has uh it's a population of about sixty thousand, and we have some very talented people you know um you have like those young ladies that are marketing experts they're very good at creating brands doing branding um they do uh, videos podcasting like you do um and there are people that might look at them on social media and like their work and say, hey, we would like for you to do this for us. Um, sure, uh, that'll cost you $500. Okay, I'll PayPal you. Sorry, I can't take PayPal. Okay, I'll cash app you. Sorry, I don't have cash app. Oh, I'll do this, I'll do that. Sorry, I can't. Uh, can, can you uh, create a, a web form for a credit card transaction? No, I'm sorry, I, don't, I can't because banking doesn't allow small businesses to do e-commerce. So our people are losing out on potentially millions of dollars coming into the country because people want to buy our local services or our local products. You know, I, I know a friend of mine, she has, uh, and I'm going to give her a shout, you should check it out. It's called Aroma Island. Check it out on Instagram. And, you know, she has to use a whole loophole system of using, creating a bank account in the United States to then receive payments there. And then she, on a monthly basis, has to transfer that back to her account in St. Martin, which she has huge wire transfer fees. Now you have entrepreneurs that said it point blank. Look, all the technology and stuff, we don't really quite get that. But if this technology can help me receive money for my work, I'm all in. She spoke, I believe, for all small businesses and entrepreneurs in St. Martin, thousands of them that uh, want to sell their products like Aroma Island, that want to sell music. You know, um, we can't open a, a, a paid Spotify account because we, we, we can't receive the money. So imagine you have a, the next Rihanna that's from Barbados or the next Nicki Minaj that's from Trinidad is sitting in St. Martin right now. I'm getting goosebumps thinking about it, man. <laughs> yeah. But they can't, they can't grow because how do those artists grow? They put their stuff on Spotify or SoundCloud. They start to receive donations or people buy their albums. They take that and then they move to LA and they brought in. But none of my local people can do that. None. Because we've been shut out from the banking system for false dubious and wrong reasons by malicious unelected people that don't give a damn about the predominantly black people in the caribbean we don't care you're just there to have to for people to come in cruise ships and see your place and then leave why can't we be part of the financial system why have we been shut out why have you told paypal stay out of the caribbean why because you want to keep us down and here we have a technology that's going to empower my people how, how do I say no to this? How do I would, it, it's wrong. If I am elected by my people, sorry, I get a little passionate about this, but oh, it's if, really if amazing. I'm elected to serve and I, my, my main purpose, okay, why are you elected? To make the lives of your people better, right? Well, it's not about giving someone fish. Give them a rod so that they can fish for themselves. And not, none of my people 
can catch any fish because the, 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 the transaction, they don't have a net. The net is just a hole. But BCH is the opportunity for entrepreneurs like them. They sat with different people and I really love um, the initiative of the community. They, they, the girls told me, man, people kept coming to us even saying, what, what do you do? We want to buy your product. We'll pay you in BCH. Open a wallet. They opened the wallet right away. Okay, like one of them is a graphic designer. We'll work with you. The guys from Grow Crypto met with them. Hey, man, we have a solution for you where we can do it in such a way that you can accept the credit card transaction and we'll link it to your bank account. You can have some fiat, some BCH. The community is looking to help these people. And that was another great moment for me in this conference. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So final question then, I guess, uh, as, as you're about to leave, I had somebody say to me that they thought your confidence in the whole Bitcoin cash thing, obviously you came out pretty hard mm -hmm. uh, whenever it was like probably almost a year ago, yeah. sort of talking about it and accepting your salary and so on. And that was a huge step and you were clearly on board with it, but they said that they've noticed your confidence and your uh, passion and um, I guess... Yeah, I'm trying to think of there's another word, but it's escaping me has solidified and increased over over time. Like you're increasingly yeah. sure you're on the right yeah. path. <laughs> Can you just speak to that, how that's been as a sort of personal journey? Um, I, have to, I have to say, because, you know, like I said, the minute I um, made that announcement, I had, for example, people connected to a certain company that's very much affiliated with El Salvador. You guys can put the dots together. A very loud person on Twitter that came to me immediately and told me, are you crazy? No, you got to do Bitcoin. You're in the wrong. You, have you ever heard of lightning and this? And we'll come to St. Martin. We'll fly down there. We'll fly you to El Salvador or come to see us in the U.S. And, and just I said, look, guys, I'm open to having that discussion. Um, yeah, but you got to you got to pull back that announcement you made and say, you know, you have I said, what? I said, I don't answer to you with all due respect. I'm not pulling back shit. You know, I, I, I made my decision. I did my research. I'm open to hearing from you. Um, and it immediately became toxic. They started also like sharing certain things about me and stuff. I just blocked them and ignore them because like I said, turtle back. I'm good. Um, and then counter to that, you have those maxis that were coming to me and trying to change our direction. And now they're also... Um, going to other islands, they're trying their best to, to see how they can they can export the, the failed model of, of El Salvador to the Caribbean countries, and it's not working. And and Korean politicians, we talk, you know, we stay in touch, especially those that are crypto centric. We we talk a lot. And um, but I have to say, one of the people that gave me the most confidence of, of everything is actually, um, some of you know him as Peter, uh, we know him as Bali G. Um, when I went to DevConnect in Amsterdam, because I wanted to learn more about the technical side of things, and although DevConnect was an Ethereum conference, I, I, wasn't, I was gonna be in Amsterdam anyway, I felt like, look, let, let me just get to understand you know, the technology of EVM and all of this stuff. And he was there. And it's interesting because we're both BCH guys, but we're at this Ethereum conference just because, well, let's see what the others are doing. And we connected so well. Um, and he explained me like for hours and hours about the history of it and how we got here and the fork and, you know, don't believe what the people are telling you and why are they, uh, um, you know, like the people in El Salvador, why are they coming at you? Because this is their plan. This is what they actually want to do. And here's the proof. Look, I have the text messages to prove it. So when I get that type of in from an OG like that, and then you have people like Roger and, and Mike Komaransky and so on, all showing me with facts. These are the facts of how we got here. And these is this is the truth of what BCH really is. Of course, my confidence is going to go up because I have the facts. I know the truth. And um, the truth shall set you free. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. Well, that might be the point to finish it then. I yeah, don't know sure. if you've got to uh, bounce, but... Uh, uh, yeah, I do have to head out. Uh, but it's it's been great, you know, being here in St. Kitts with you guys. Um, being on the podcast, I always watch, so now I'm actually on it. Yay. I'm, <laughs> I'm on. <laughs> I made it. Um, no, but um, all of you, everyone has, has an important role. Um, I don't feel like my role is any more important than anyone else. I would even say, um, honestly, you know, my focus being on the regulatory side is, is one branch of it. 
you know, I, I, I picture if it was an org chart, so to speak, is like there's one little box that just says MP regulation, but you have all these other boxes of people. What, what you do, you know, like uh, um, fiendish crypto with the, the Twitter spaces, the devs, um, the onboarders. Everyone has a role to, to play in this, and we do it because we believe it's good for the world, you know, and that's we just have to stay focused, stay focused on what we believe in and know that what we're doing for generations to come is going to help millions of people around the world. Yeah, I think yeah. this will be amazing to see in so five thank years. Thank you so much for having me. No, thank you. Thank you for coming on the show and uh, safe travels. All right. All right. Talk soon. All right. Yeah, just good here. Here we go. Well, I might bring in some of the audience. Do you, want to, do you want to get involved here and do the second half of the show? You, you can. We could do two. Oh, no. Okay. All right. Rory, get in here. All right. <laughs> so, uh, first things first, and just speaking in the mic, just here, right? Uh, okay, so introduce yourself a little bit for the uh, the viewers and listeners at home. Sure. Uh, well, my name is Romit. I'm from Bangalore in India. I'm the founder of uh, Zappi.io. We are basically a Bitcoin Cash non-custodial wallet. Um, and yeah, I, I mean, our primary focus is the Indian market because, you know, there are a lot of wallets in the space, but uh, nothing specific where Indians can use. Uh, there's a lot of things in India that are, you know, there are a lot of features that are required that are specific to the Indian market and uh, none of them were being targeted. So even as simple as buying Bitcoin Cash is extremely hard because most of the Indian exchanges, they disable Bitcoin Cash. Like you cannot deposit, you cannot withdraw, you can only trade, but let's say you have to get USDT first or, or BTC first. So there's clearly a push against BCH in, in India. So I've, I've been in, in the Bitcoin space since 2013. So I saw the entire, you know, uh, whatever happened in the space and uh, I understood that Bitcoin Cash continues to be, you know, the original Bitcoin. So yeah, I mean, decided to build Zapit to enable Bitcoin Cash payments uh, in India and, and push and push more for it. Yeah. Can you speak to me a little bit about India specifically? I know it has a bit of a history with like gold, for instance, they love you know, jewelry and things like that. There's sort of some kind of like cultural memory perhaps of a pre-fiat time or they've been through struggles and oppression and so on that they can understand the utility yeah. of sort of non-custodial or independent value, uh, you know, transaction and uh, storage of, of wealth and so on and so forth. Tell me a bit more about that. Sure. Yeah. I mean, uh, in India, trade was pretty big. Like for thousands of years, Indians have been trading with, you know, even the, the Roman Empire, for example. In India, you can find the Roman coins, the gold coins. So we knew that spices and silk and all, all of that was traded with the Western world from, from long back, for almost 2000 years now. Um, and just like everywhere else in the world, uh, India has also had its uh, instances of bank runs where you know, the banks just lend out so much uh, IOUs that they end up not having enough gold for the people who withdraw it. Um, so yeah, there are a lot of people that lost gold or, or their wealth like that, right? Like they, they could never get back their own gold. Um, but you know, it's, it's really hard to educate people about how not to trust a central party with, um, with your wealth. We see that happen even today, for example, right? Um, so, I, so I think the best way that uh, back then Indians found out how to do it was uh, to create a festival, like a cultural or a religious festival. Um, through that, one of the main concepts was to actually, for women to buy gold or to acquire gold in the form of jewelry. I mean, they would not wear it on a regular basis. It would be just for, you know, events or some functions, right? Like some grand event. Uh, but most of the time it's just stored as value because yeah, cash would be used on a regular basis, but uh, we know that cash is not entirely trustworthy. So there was always a cultural thing where the, the women were, would, would buy a lot of gold and uh, they just hold it. And uh, yeah, I think Indian women uh, hold like overall in the entire country probably 40% of uh, of the gold reserves so that that's a that's a huge thing yeah that's absolutely <laughs> more than amazing. the central banks of a lot of countries so yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah that's exactly it a secret uh, powerhouse of the global economy yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, a very uh, quiet perhaps demographic but one that you know it's just <laughs> getting the uh, job done and i'm also very interested in the fact that 
uh, India as a country, I feel, is quite entrepreneurial. Somebody talked to me the other day. I think we actually had a bit of a chat about it yeah. too, where with outsourcing to India is obviously a huge market. So there's an area of remittances that plays into it. But also uh, Indian people, I think, are very pragmatic. You know, they are not prone to being against something uh, if they can see that it works or they're kind of savvy in in that way. Do you think that also plays into how crypto is going to be adopted in India? Well, yeah, uh, business has been a big part of India throughout, it, throughout its history. Uh, but unfortunately, they knew how to do small business like, you know, locally, but Indians never knew how to scale up. That was the one thing that Indians always suffered. Like, how do you get any business model to, to global level. Uh, but I think only recently, Indians are learning how to do that. Like more and more companies, more and more businesses are starting to glo uh, go global, uh, which is a good thing. I think uh, Indians are good at business relatively. Um, I think we can see that l most of the company CEOs are now uh, Indians because I think they kind of understand how businesses work. But yeah, pair that with uh, the ability to scale that and I think it, it works out pretty well. Well, it's kind of strange because India obviously having such an enormous population, you think <laughs> there would be a bit of a hand in getting from small to big because there would already be a big domestic market to sort of gain well, traction in. The thing is, it, it, India was always a lot of, uh, very spiritual land, right? So there was not much greed involved. Like that's why India never ventured out of his, the Indian land to try and conquer other lands, right? Uh, it's the same way, like even individual people think the same way. Like, yeah, I mean, I'm servicing my local market. I'm providing service to the individuals around me. And yeah, that's more than enough. I'm earning enough to, you know, make a living. So I, even, even now, a lot of people are still like that. Of course, we need to get them out of that uh, thinking. And, you know, economically, it makes sense to scale up. Um, but yeah, I guess it's, it's, it's been always a cultural thing not to scale up, which is which has been the downside of, of the Indian market. But yeah, we see that happening now. So that's okay. Yes. Okay. So talk to me about Zapit. Obviously, you made the huge announcement yeah. at the conference that the uh, UPI system, which is essentially like the domestic uh, instant payments, it yeah. almost sounds kind of crypto-like. Has yes, already yes, yes. been implemented it, in in India. Yeah. So yeah, explain that. Uh, I mean, I'm sure people can also check out your yeah. your talk at the conference. But just for the listeners, give a bit of an overview of that. Sure. Uh, maybe I'll just give a history about the UPI itself. Um, you know, in 2017-18, there was this event that happened uh, called demonetization, where they basically withdrew all the higher notes, like 500 rupee notes and 1,000 rupee notes. Uh, before that, India was mostly a cash economy. Everybody just used cash. Um, but after that, it became so hard to use cash because a lot of people would just stand outside the ATM lines. And uh, it was a huge mess because, you know, you'd assume that in a, in a country with one billion people, there aren't enough ATM machines. And yeah, you would get like blocks of uh, like lines of people like that that would kind of stretch out to blocks right uh so people were like okay this is you know not good we want a better solution and uh, that's when digital payments just kicked off like literally now compared to like four years back which was heavily reliant on cash now it's completely digital so upi was just there you know uh they started like six years back but they were at the right position to to take over um but just before that, a lot of like independent wallets came out. Like there was Paytm, there was Google Pay, there was Amazon Pay. And most of the money started going into the wallet accounts of individual companies from the bank accounts. The government saw this as a threat. They're like, oh, the money is leaving the bank. Well, I, I think we all can agree that most of the uh, banks around the world don't really have enough reserves. So if you withdraw enough, there will be a bank run just like, you know, other exchanges like FTX and all that. It's the same situation and, and they saw that as a threat. Yeah. They saw that as a threat. So UPI offered a solution where they said, you know, we can get money bank, back into the bank accounts. Uh, we have built a unified payments interface, which every other app, including the banks, can utilize. Um, so yeah, government was like, yeah, well, this sounds good. So they basically forced everyone to start using UPI. And uh, it got all the money out of the wallets into back into the bank accounts. You could still use Google Pay. You could still use Paytm and any other bank app. But the system that those apps or the banks would use is through the UPI. 
and it just blew up now you know as i mentioned uh well maybe before that yeah there are millions of merchants um the, the biggest stores you could name off like starbucks kfc you know zara whatever it is the biggest malls to the smallest street vendors where they're selling you know peanuts or or watermelons or something like that you can see like street cards uh having a qr code of upi you just go and pay everybody accepts so we saw that as a bigger threat for crypto actually we're like no cbdcs are not the bigger threat like from indian point of view right cbdcs are it's going to come out pretty late we saw upi as a as a bigger threat uh, to crypto adoption like most of the bch guys know that okay you can most of the other world you can say that hey you know we have instant transactions low fees and uh, yeah i mean it's easy to use well in india you have the same thing but for no fees like zero fees so how do you compete with that like we would go to every merchant we're like hey you know this bitcoin cash you know it's a new currency it's a decentralized all that we would try to tell them but they're like yeah but we already have something similar so why would we use it so it was a very hard thing to you know get hold of merchants from the indian point of view so that is why we thought might as well integrate upi with crypto right that would be the the, the best uh, approach so yeah the announcement that we made was uh, that with zapier you'll be able to make payments uh, to any merchant that accepts upi which was over 60 million merchants like this is just offline like stores uh, but there are also like e- e-commerce websites and, and stuff uh, which is over 40 million websites uh, but the beauty of upi is it's not just merchants right like visa and mastercard are just merchants you cannot so for example i cannot use my visa card to make a payment to you for example unless you're a merchant right but upi i can make a payment to you directly like peer to peer uh so yeah it's the same system with zapid you can uh, make payments to any other person that's using upi as well which is over 200 million indians at this point so so that essentially means that if you are in india you could basically just put all your money in bch yeah. and be able to just spend it everywhere so yeah, at least on the yeah. for an, for an individual okay that the on the other rescind they're receiving the rupees that they were expecting so explain that to me so the you have the qr code that you yeah. scan and it's kind of like a crypto yeah. type transaction you scan that with any kind of wallet or software or whatever and and it sends but then the money lands in your bank again so if i'm like big on google pay for instance what i have to take my money out of my bank account put it in my google pay then i spend it at inr and then uh, people paying me to my inr code goes into my bank account and i kind of have to keep moving funds across is that how it works yeah it's it's quite simple so you don't ha- have to put money into individual apps if if the money is already in your bank account your every other app just connects to your bank account so okay. google google connects to your bank account like paytm right, connects yes. to your bank account okay uh, zap it does not connect to your bank account but it does the opposite where if you have bitcoin cash you can scan a qr code and you can make the payment but the inr goes to their account you yes. can pay with bch but uh they, they receive, receive INR. INR but they don't know that you have paid with bitcoin cash yes so yeah yeah so it's opaque from their point of view yeah and so we make the payment so we send out the INR yes yeah. so how do you manage that uh yourself then are you acting as a sort of custodian bank kind of thing or uh, are yeah yeah how does that work no because uh, the zapit wallet itself is non custodial so as long as the funds are in your wallet you hold it but the the moment you make a payment technically it leaves your wallet so you don't have that money anymore right uh but for a split second yes we take the bch we can conf- we make sure that we received the bch and we instantly send out the inr it's instant like it's not you know t plus 1 like not after one day or two days or if you make a you know payment at the, the weekend it's not like it's going to be transferred on monday nothing like that it's you know, even at midnight it it goes through it's it's instantly settled to the merchant's account Yeah, and one question I had people ask me about this system then is how do you make money if it, yeah. if INR is fearless and the government is kind of subsidizing that you're obviously not in that situation uh and you, and I don't know are you tacking on a small BCH fee to do this or do you have some other revenue model? Yeah, yeah, so we have multiple one is that yes, we will be charging for payments with respect to fees, you know, the banks actually hate UBI because they have to pay fees to npci which is a corporation that runs upi right um 
initially it was just a push to get adoption uh, but the central bank and uh, all the commercial banks got together and uh, they were discussing about how to charge a fee for upi just when they were about to announce that hey you know we would be probably charging fees the government realized that what they were doing and they're like okay this might be a threat to uh, you know a negative adoption of uh, of upi and they said okay we declare upi as a public good so they literally said okay you cannot charge it like they declared that upi cannot be charged they literally told the banks to find another way to make money which is you know not not how it should be but <laughs> not how banks <laughs> what yeah. they like to hear yeah <laughs> yeah so there's definitely some tension between the banks and the indian government in, with respect to upi uh but i think uh, i don't know i don't know the exact specific of what's happening behind the doors you know um but from our point of view they cannot charge a very low fee right like because it's the banking system and things like that they have to charge slightly higher fee so i think it's not going to be sustainable over a long period of time or they have to either fund it through inflation right which is which always hurts the consumer at the end of the day um but we with bitcoin cash we can charge as low as 1/10th of a cent so yes. that's that's where we would try and make money which is uh, yeah we can charge a very low fee which will still show maybe 0. Point, less than 0.01 dollars so yes. it's really negligible so they don't even see that uh, the difference there uh but that's just from the user's point of view now just because we have access to 60 million users does not mean that our uh, job is completed right like we still have to onboard the merchant to accept bcs directly and the advantage that we can give them is uh, general uh payment processors charge close to 2% in india for merchants uh we can charge as low as 0.5 or even 0.1 for that matter uh we're still deciding on that we have fixed at 0.1 but some places we might have to bump it up to 0.5 uh but for now 0.1 is good enough for us to make enough money to uh be profitable uh we need less than 1% share of the market uh the, the biggest app with respect to upi is actually uh, it's called phone pay uh they control almost 40% of the upi market and they are not profitable with 40% share they are not able to make a profit with our numbers with less than 0.5% we we can become profitable so we have a bigger advantage yeah well it sounds amazing because yeah i can see it's sort of like you've solved like half of the problem and then yeah. obviously you can build up on the consumer side in terms of telling individual people that this is an option and now everything's plugged in for them so that is already like a gigantic step uh and then like you say you kind of need to build up the other half of it where maybe you go to the merchant and you say oh well did you know that actually and i guess you can maybe have the stats and see like we have the most users paying at this place that already are using bch so you could go to that merchant and say did you know in the last week you've had 10 people in here who want to pay you in bitcoin cash are you interested in that blah 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 it's the same as inr just here's a different qr code that you need to display at your terminal or something is that would that be the strategy yeah uh, i think one of the biggest challenges of getting merchants to accept crypto in general is what can they really do with it right um yeah there have been other companies that kind of converted to fiat and send it to them but the charge is usually higher for them and we've demonstrated that we can do it for a lower charge um but now with this specific feature we can show them that you don't have to convert you can go and restock your supply by paying with zapper directly with with INR to the next person so they've already yeah, got no, all with that with fixed with bch yes like exactly you receive the bch and you can spend the bch immediately everywhere immediately. with all immediately. your supplies yeah, it's, it's already available everywhere that's so yeah crazy. We, i think amazing. we have solved the chicken and the egg problem with with respect to merchant adoption but now uh, the challenge would be to yeah get users to start using and i believe uh, an incentive needs to be there for users to start using that's where we brought our uh, 25% up to 25% discounts with uh, using our uh, zapped token so if you re- redeem zapped token you get up to 25% Uh, discount on payments so i think that's a pretty huge push for so so where does the so redeeming the zapit uh, token where do yeah. where do users get the zapit token and how are you essentially covering this difference yeah yeah so so there are a lot of companies in india that give um, discounts or cashbacks right uh, they do it in two ways either you force the merchant to take a hit and you promise them volume or users or as a company you take the hit right like there are a lot of companies that yes, give reward subsidized like uber at the moment losing money to 
uh, subsidize the fees for everyone to <laughs> take car rides. Yeah. <laughs> well, in India, there's actually a company called Cred, which has uh, become really big. Like, it's like a credit card company that uh, gives huge discounts, but they're burning money. Like they're burning <laughs> all their reserves by, by giving all the cash because they're not really making money from that. They're just burning to get more users. Yeah, it's attractive. You are going to get a lot of users, but they're going to leave as soon as the, your funds go dry. So we saw both the models as flawed. We're like, okay, we cannot force the merchant to give discounts. Neither can we continue to give a lot of discounts because we would be burning money. Uh, so what we decided was, well, you know, crypto has a lot of solutions. DeFi, as much as people like it or hate it, has a solution for this. Decentralized exchanges can act as uh, a market for this, right? So we basically have built a model where you earn Z uh, Zap token. Like we have a reward section in the uh, in the app. You can earn as much rewards as you want, uh, and then you can redeem it. But while redeeming it, what happens is the Zapped goes to the market. Like through a Dex, there is a swap that happens where uh, there's you know the farms and liquidity and all the, all of those things. So the the zap goes into the liquidity pool. You get the BCH in return as a discount. So let's say you're paying ten dollars for something for food or whatever. You have one dollar worth of zapped. But if you attach that zap to the transaction, uh, yeah, you you only pay nine dollars worth of um, of BCH. One dollar comes from the dex. So it's uh, it's the market that gives you the discount. So who's buying the zap on yeah. the other side? Yeah, so the, the buy uh, side is what we are building right now, which is uh, we've already had this, but uh, it, it was more of a manual thing, but we are trying to automate that, which is uh, in the reward section, the way we give rewards is uh, we also have ads in them. Um, like businesses can advertise their, their products um, by paying in zap. So they have to buy zap from the deal. We don't sell zap, so we only reward zap. Uh, but they have to buy Zap from the uh, decentralized exchange. So, the, so there's a buy pressure and there's a sell pressure, which which does not imbalance the market. Uh, yeah, of course, there's the tokenomics where we have to adjust that accordingly. But uh, but we have the cycle, like we have the entire cycle going now, and we believe that this is an endless loop. Like this is literally a a sustainable reward system. So yeah, that's amazing. I mean, yeah. how many? Uh, companies and products and whatever in crypto have launched DeFi tokens and it's basically like there's this famous clip of uh, Sam Bankman Freed with <laughs> imagine you have a box and the you just know that the box is great you don't really know what it does it doesn't matter but then the money comes in and then you've got 20 million dollars right yeah. you've actually thought it out and since it integrates with the advertising in the app which is used to pay things you know you can see how everything fits together here so that's that's amazing. And just tell me a little bit more about the wallet itself, right? Because I think one of the things I will need to look more at Zappet, I've had a quick look at it uh, the other day, but uh, with Zappet and Paytaka, uh, I think it's very important that we have alternatives to the Bitcoin.com yeah. wallet. They're yeah. doing a great job, but also, you know, as an ecosystem, we need to be resilient to if there are any problems there, right? So it's very important that the community has more different BCH wallets uh, tuned up for for spending and offering different features. So yeah, tell me about the wallet itself. Yeah, so when we began, as I said, uh, it was specific to the Indian market. Uh, so when we launched, we actually launched with a peer to peer exchange, because uh, when we when we decided to launch, this was when the uh, Central Bank of India had uh, introduced a ban on uh, crypto companies from operating in India. So if you were a crypto company, you would not get a bank account. If for almost a year or two, you would not get a bank account. Uh, so all the exchanges kind of shut down, almost shut down. So there was no way to buy Bitcoin Cash or, or sell Bitcoin Cash or even use Bitcoin Cash. So that's when we decided to have a P2P exchange which would not require uh, a bank account from, from our side. Uh, so we basically built a smart contract uh, which is very similar to local.bitcoin.com which was very surprising because we both were working on the same solution. Of course, they came a few months before us. Uh, we, we were a bit late, but we were working on the same thing at the same time, which was incredible. Uh, but yeah, you know, they launched specifically for trading, but we launched it for onboarding and offboarding. I guess that's the on-ramping and uh, off-ramping, basically. So if you wanted to add money to your wallet, you cannot use a bank account, but you could buy it from somebody else in, as a you know, in a P2P manner. So that is what we introduced first. And uh, 
yeah I, i guess we did have a lot of other things like we have the dividends feature built in like a lot of people ask me oh why don't you have this feature or or this feature like you know we do, we don't have multiple addresses yet right so why don't you have multiple addresses they ask like there are other wallets that are doing that but they don't have services so our focus was the services like we focused mainly on the services that does not exist we can build features later on right like we can probably build more security you know more anonymity later on uh but other if you really want that you could use other wallet but you, you can't use services in them so we'll just focus on that <laughs> yeah it's just about prioritizing you can only do so many things yeah. at once yeah. so yeah let's talk about the whole uh, market i have to touch on this for the listeners <laughs> over the last week or so we've seen ftx has completely blown up and melted down. I have an article here. Divisions in Sam Bankman-Fried's crypto empire blur on his trading titan Alameda's balance sheet. So this was November the 2nd. So this was a couple of weeks ago now. But essentially, on the last episode of the podcast, uh, or, or the one before the St. Kitts one, um, we talked about how he was calling for more regulation and so on and so forth. And what do you know, less than a week later, it just comes out that uh, his token that they had for the exchange, which they hold most of, was then being used to back up his trading firm. But of course, those assets are not actually worth as much as they said they were, because if they tried to sell it, who would buy it? Like they are the largest holders and the only ones who really care about it. So once this uh, became publicly known, or at least once people started paying attention, all the house of cards came apart, as it always does in every cryptocurrency. All the uh, customers of FTX are essentially scammed and their money is gone, or they don't know if they can get withdrawals back and whatever there was a bit of trying to patch it up like there always is don't worry guys funds are safe which is always the indicator that they're not safe it's over <laughs> see you later There's, if you know your money is gone when somebody tells you it's definitely there uh, in crypto it seems like about there's a, about a 10 billion dollar hole in all of that and it's starting to spread into the rest of the industry with block fights so it's just another round of the three arrows capital and uh all celsius all that stuff it's still just going on in 2022 it's just clearing out huge chunks of the market with these scammy tokens that are completely overvalued or trying to give yield farming on unsustainable you know products right so uh what what have you made of all this ftx stuff it's been kind of interesting i think to have all that going on while we've been here at the conference focused on something completely different yeah i mean just before i i left from india i I saw this brewing up and i was like okay ftx is gonna collapse (laughs) i told my friends that i'm like because we see this pattern again and again and again and again so at this point you can clearly say that yeah it is it's gonna happen um yeah i mean i i believe that these big companies that can raise a lot of money very easily because they have the right contacts or whatever um and for some reason they don't rely on on real business models they always end up looking like ponzi schemes or cuz they don't know how to make money like they really don't know how to build a model around a financial uh, system to to make money including the the banks right like they also operate this well they are just banks like ftx is a crypto bank so bank runs have not stopped uh the fact that you know after 10 plus years of uh, bitcoin being in existence they have not learned people have not learned why bitcoin came into existence in the first place you know, the, the first lines of uh, the white paper saying not to th- trust a third party just does not get into people's head for some reason so uh, but i think it, it's been on our part as well because we have not built better solutions in the non custodial uh, side of things they just build better solution where people can use but of course it ends up collapsing so that's why we are we are focusing on that we're like okay we look at all the things that are being built in the centralized or custodial uh, places and we're like okay we have to build better solutions but while being non-custodial and uh, i think this is not the end as well there's going to be more uh, i think there has been I don't know uh, other exchanges that are getting into trouble now like crypto.com and uh, all of these these people are uh, spending huge money on advertising on all the sports platforms like I watch a lot of F1 and uh, crypto.com is everywhere <laughs> is everywhere like uh, recently I watched cricket and FTX was everywhere right like on the stadium of of the cricket FTX being a huge I'm like okay <laughs> this clearly is not the uh, the right thing that's that's happening like if you're 
Well, I don't know. <laughs> it's it's really bad, um, I would say. Yeah, it's certainly very expensive for them to do that. And like you said, maybe the centralized solutions are quicker or slicker at getting to a good product, but they're kind of taking a shortcut that comes back to bite them in the end once it all uh, blows up and just burning money to uh, acquire users in that way is, is not at all uh, feasible or, or sustainable. So I've got my meme of the week is in this... Um, in this vein so it's the meme of the guy who's standing next to a bucket of water which is slowly draining out money so that's the guy's labeled sbf and then the bucket of water is uh losing eight billion dollars in consumer funds and then he's the guy slaps a, a piece of tape on that's supposed to fix the problem uh but it just spreads the water everywhere and that's uh him saying sorry so i mean all the money gets gone it's lost it's all scammed everybody's fucked and uh, what do they say about, oh, sorry, guys. Like, yeah, yeah. people are not going to get their money back. It's a harsh lesson. And I need to remind viewers of this show, not your keys, not your coins. Withdraw 100% of your coins. I saw some commentary on Twitter by people saying, after this has happened, I have withdrawn 90% of my crypto for exchanges. No, 100%. percent yeah. What are you doing? Like, it doesn't matter how many times they get scammed. They're still like, no, but I can leave a little bit there. Zero. Leave zero there take it all out why do you need it on an exchange if you need it yeah. send it in sell it or buy it or whatever and then just withdraw it that's it should be on an exchange as little time as possible not your keys not your coins yeah i just have to say it for the millionth time on the show it's gotta be the those, mantra of the show those platforms are for only for traders anyway like why are regular people holding money in these kind of exchanges like you're not trading on a daily basis you're just buying and selling you can do that on non-custodial platforms like yeah. If it's, it's if if you're just buying maybe once a month or once every few months, you can do that pretty easily on non-custodial platforms. You don't have to keep it on these centralized custodial ex exchanges. Well, with respect to I think uh, regulation that these guys want, uh, it is to. Well, I, I think it's it's pretty common to know that uh, regulation is just to stop smaller businesses from coming up. Like yeah, once you get big you want you want to keep that monopoly right like or, or duopoly or whatever it is so you you kind of fight for regulation they're like yeah we want regulation like yes i think uh, all crypto companies must buy a one million dollar license i will zap it from uh you know from the bedroom of my house yeah yeah like i was at you know just churning code uh, every single day i mean i don't think we have lost anyone's money till now well, because we just built the right product, right? We didn't need, you know, billions of dollars to build this. Um, we just needed a, a little bit of time and, uh, yeah, good skill and good good support from the community to, to be able to do this. So, yeah, I mean, if, if these big companies get their way of getting regulations in, I wouldn't be able to build it. Like, where, where am I going to get a million dollars from? They're like, oh, but you need to be able to secure people's funds. I'm like, yeah, that's why it's non-custodial. Like, it's already secured. So Yeah, it's amazing, I think, because every time this happens, people say the regulated entities are the ones blowing up. FTX was the most heavily regulated and the yeah. most advocating for regulation, yeah. and they blew up. It's clearly... And what do people think? We need more regulation. No, that's a, we've had enough regulation. There needs to be... We need to think differently about this problem, and that's where it comes to... To crypto and education and stuff, and being everything a big actually, part of it. like yes. with respect to everything, like if there's any problem in the world, regulations don't fix the problem. We need entrepreneurs fixing the problem with whatever solution they come up with, and yeah, there'll always be a multitude of solutions that we get to choose from. Regulations never solve these problems, so yeah, <laughs> definitely, definitely agree with that. So then I've uh, added this new maybe like segment is to the show where I realized we had there's so much going on in crypto that I can't cover everything that I want to cover in the you know about two hours of the show before it's just going on forever so uh, instead I've just got a couple of little uh, highlights of things that if listeners are interested if they're wondering what's going on in crypto if you've got the time and energy to do your own research you can dig into these um threads of of what's happening maybe so i'm just going to read them off here and maybe you can uh have a have an opinion on one or two if you think uh they you, you know you have a take on one of them okay so the first one is kim.com has showed off his demo of the long way to bch app cash rain he says the open beta will be available in the next uh 30 days and he said that you know a couple of weeks ago so we might be seeing soon uh some progress on on that i wrote a review on reddit which people can check out if they're they're interested in that We've got Bitcoin Core have pushed ahead with their full uh, replace by fee. 
in v24.0 so it's now basically wrecking zero confirmation on the bdc chain <laughs> completely and uh john carvalho has been uh upset about that and tweeting about that because his lightning network uh, scheme is kind of falling apart and you also have bsv have released a v1.0.13 with supporting code for the reassignment of digital assets so the ability to essentially steal satoshis or anyone else's coins uh at the behest of legal orders or essentially craig Wright's uh whims on any of these topics do you want to uh have a have a take or oh all look uh, pretty exciting <laughs> <laughs> juicy ones yeah we could go forever yeah, on all yeah. these but uh pick one <laughs> but with respect to the kim.com's uh, cash train actually i you know coming from a different time zone i didn't get to test it so i've not even seen how it works i've only heard from other people uh but i would be excited to see how this can be taken forward uh, i know that it's it's more like you know tipping your community and things like that um but i'm quite interested to actually you know see the demo so maybe i can only make a comment after i've used it um but i think it's great uh you know kim.com being a supporter of bitcoin cash you know he's delivered a product he's delivering a product now which is amazing uh i think there's a lot more to come from him so pretty excited to check that out uh but with respect to bitcoin core oh, i didn't know they actually pushed it i thought it was just a discussion that was uh taking place i think it's getting over the line yeah oh it's great actually you know <laughs> <laughs> yeah no this is amazing for 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 us right um you know it, after the conference uh, we're just having a discussion with uh, Paul Bilzerian who was at the conference and he was talking about the United States right he was saying about whatever they are doing it's like he said this is the first country that is committing a suicide like from a country's point of view with uh, the destruction of their own uh, uh, currency and and their system and things like that i think the same thing applies to uh, a bitcoin is the first blockchain that's committing suicide which is awesome i think this is uh, awesome. yeah actively not <laughs> trying to uh, fix themselves yeah. they it's like, they're actually making it worse deliberately yeah. i mean yeah these guys were the same people that uh, were talking about just optional rbf being an awesome thing so yeah might as well go f- full on you know <laughs> awesome I, i feel like it's the same with bsb like they're both just like all right let's well, time to end it <laughs> There you go, yeah. Just well, B- I, I think uh, well, that's it, exactly. I think BSV is trying to commit murder for other coins. It's <laughs> the difference. <laughs> They're trying to murder other chains while Bitcoin is trying to kill themselves. So, oh my goodness, this is well, this we're is we're, 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 we're threading <laughs> a nice yeah, uh, just, fine uh, line yeah. through the middle. You know, uh, dodged those ones and yeah. This is what I tell ones, people. Right? You know, uh, like this experiment is great because we see Bitcoin not scaling at all on one end, and uh, Bitcoin SV too much scaling. and uh, they have their own issues with reorgs and, and all of that and bitcoin cash is looking at both and like ha huh, you know we are sitting on the sofa comfortably and seeing yeah both of them are at the wrong side so yes. we know we we literally have the floor and the ceiling to bounce off of now yes. so we know where to be in, in, in the middle so yeah it certainly helps with uh, calibrating ourselves all right i've got community comment of the week this week comes from bitcoin cash otis uh on the bch bull telegram he said People are going to buy and sell what they want, how much they want. You can't fool people into buying BCH or whatever. What we can do is make BCH as useful as possible so people will want to buy it. Of course, in the beginning it'll be BCH advocates who will be majority of any hedge users, but if we do it right, others will get attracted to do their business on BCH chain, grow our transactions volumes, lock more BCH in contracts and pay our fees in BCH. End quote. So I really just wanted to highlight that because the any hedge talk was so popular today, yeah. and uh, it certainly is a real case of utility and solving a real need. Uh, John just got uh, flooded with people after the conference <laughs> asking him about when can we have this and we need this, yeah. and you know I'm sure they're going to be making a lot of money, and uh, you know they've really got a unique uh, solution here. So. I really Can just I just make a comment props. about how we are using any hedge which yes, I actually I forgot ahead, to no. mention about this in the conference which is uh, you know unlike most of the payment processors when they receive the crypto or let's say bitcoin cash they immediately sell it in the market which kind of drives down the price of bitcoin cash uh but whenever we receive the bitcoin cash we put it into the any hedge contract so we are able to stabilize uh the the amount without actually changing the price of of bitcoin cash so we can do it on a on a longer basis and we don't have to change the the price just real quick just like you're not custodial right so explain when you're receiving the this is for the payments 
Yeah, so for the UPI payment, so when you scan the UPI QR code, we receive the Bitcoin cash, and then technically we have to sell that Bitcoin cash for INR and send out the INR. But with enough liquidity, we can send out the INR and the Bitcoin cash that we receive, we immediately hedge. So we get the same INR value, but we don't have to sell it immediately. So it does not change the price of Bitcoin cash. And uh, we are, when we do the other way around as well, we don't have to buy. So every single payment that's happening is not changing the price of, of, uh, of Bitcoin cash. So we don't have to dump the market or even pump the market for that matter. So it's more of a gradual thing. Uh, you can build up your own local locked reserves. Yes. And then yes. people can just flick in and out yeah. of that. And then you're slowly building up a floor of uh, your yeah. company's reserves in liquidity. Yeah, yeah. So that's why uh, we as a payment system is completely different from others. Right. So we are using NEH slightly differently. It's not, we're not uh, allowing individual users to hedge yet. Uh, but we ourselves as a company, we are using it for our payments. So yes, that's amazing. Just the money is, again, just it's building a, that circular economy here. That's absolutely amazing. All right, so then we've got a uh, message to the community. Last uh, slide is just an open forum for you to, especially like with the conference <laughs> yeah. and everything that we've we've just seen, what do you think the Bitcoin Cash community needs to hear or or think about it or you know tell a story of uh, i don't know something funny that happened at the conference maybe uh whatever comes to mind sure i think uh, i'd like to maybe just make a comment as to um in the bitcoin cash community i see a lot of people still attacking uh, a lot of other chains i mean we can point out the flaws or why they're they're wrong or things like that but i think the attacks have to stop because the more you attack others they will also attack you back it's better to work together and see the advantages of both like i don't think we will we can't be bitcoin cash maximalists right that we have to admit that there are other communities there are other people in 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 the world that will always want to be heard or want to be known so you will you can never have a monopoly over or anything so the, people want to stay relevant so just to stay relevant they'll always choose another coin because they will be relevant in their own community so the more you attack other communities they will also attack you back and i feel like that's where it's from me it's been the hardest to get people into bitcoin cash because of all the attacks that have taken place on bitcoin cash we need to change that sentiment um and and it's going to be hard because bitcoin cash has already had such a bad name um but yeah, I think the attacks definitely have to uh, stop. Uh, it's okay to point out the technical flaws. That's totally fine. Uh, but I still see a lot of people in the community attacking uh, other coins. And I don't think we will ever get enough people supporting Bitcoin Cash if we don't do that. Um, it's better to work together. It's better to see, okay, some coin chains may have something better than us. It's better to try and make ourselves better. But let's work together and uh, let's support each other. Um, I guess that's one thing that I, I really wanted to say. Yeah, okay. Certainly, I guess we, yeah, we've got to focus on ourselves and just lead by example. Just uh, don't, don't refute their argument by getting some salty uh, comment thread. Just okay. spend that same time and energy on making Bitcoin Cash so much better that it's just an undeniable yeah, just point thing. out the advantages. Don't tell your shit. Tell, hey, you know, we are better because of this. <laughs> yeah, that's better. <laughs> yes. Yes, okay, maybe try and be, make it more of a dialogue. Yeah, yeah. Okay, all right. Well, I guess that will pretty much uh, do it for the show here. Yeah, I was going to say, yeah, maybe does uh, we in the guests, do we have any uh, in the crowd, any <laughs> message to the community that uh, anyone, anybody else wants to to chip in with? Yeah, yeah. yeah. All right. Okay. Good to see you, mate. Good Bitcoin to see you. Jason yeah. uh, checking in. Just in the here, here's the here's the here's the mic. Just talking. Oh, there. the mic's right here. Okay, all right. So yeah, give a give a quick uh, thoughts on the conference. What did you think? Um, the best thing about this conference is I did not have to change currencies. Yep, that's it. 100 percent adoption. I, I live on from Bit your point of view, right? Yeah, from my point of view, I live on Bitcoin Cash. I come to Bitcoin Cash Island, and it's still Bitcoin Cash. No USD needed. Not a not a single EC. No. Not touched anything, right? Not Since just, he landed, just, just all land, BC. Boom. I I flew into LA and Miami, and they were going to charge me for a hundred dollars Australian. They were going to give me back forty-four American dollars. That's a massive price gouge, man. Now I'm telling you now, if if there was a Bitcoin Cash merchant at the airport, I would choose them over any other merchant. Why? Because it's so expensive to change your currency into another currency, man. 
So I think St. Kitts is like the leading country in revolution of how travelers like me, like I'm a novice. This is my first time ever overseas. And to have a country that takes on Bitcoin Cash where I can just travel there and not worry about exchanges and being ripped off by, because I got exchange at an airport or somewhere else. That's a massive thing. That's opening up the country to the whole world. Do you see the gravity of that? It means Bitcoin Jason at any time, oh man, I'm feeling a bit flat. I oh know, I'll go to St. Kitts. I will choose to fast and not eat in America to save that money because they don't have Bitcoin Cash there. I'll spend it all in St. Kitts. Not only that, it's because I'm not transferring Australian dollars into American dollars. It gives me more play money to spend in the country, which is absolutely massive because that means that country that accepts Bitcoin Cash gets extra tourism dollars. That's huge. <laughs> yeah, it is. It is absolutely huge. And <laughs> applause from the audience. And uh, so, but just tell me about uh, the the locals adopting. Like I know I've seen you, you know, trying to onboard people and definitely we've been doing tipping of the yep. wait, you know, waiters and so on and so forth. Like are you, you're seeing that uh, circulation, maybe compare and contrast a little bit with St. Kitts, with, with Townsville. What do you think are the strengths or disadvantages of, of either one? Um, St. Kitts has got a massive event, advantage over the Bitcoin Cash City uh, because they've got Bitcoin Cash ATMs yeah. straight off the bat. So if I was a merchant and I accepted Bitcoin Cash, I can easily transfer that. That's not a problem. Um, so the, the roadblocks for getting a Bitcoin Cash merchant in St. Kitts is far less than what I face. Uh, they are open to the idea uh, where mine, I come from a silver spoon nation. We've, we've been called the lucky country. I don't know how lucky we're going to stay because we take for granted so much. And St. Kitts, like I am so energized by St. Kitts because they are entrepreneurial. And just by meeting the people here, I've just been like, it's, I never realized how much of a box I put myself in until I came here. I've like, whoa, Jace, you need to step out. Um, I was talking to a young Indian, um, a guy so young he could be like my son. And this guy just expanded my, my thinking and my horizon where I thought, fair income, I've been limiting myself. Um, so there are some merchants here that don't accept Bitcoin Cash, but it's free to do so. And if they make it legal tender, game over, man. It's just like, yeah, you know what I mean? So St. Kitts is... Is the country I, I would if I had to live in a country, I would live in St Kitts. Yeah, I I'm actually looking at seeing if I can get citizenship here, uh, maybe a bit of property um, as my plan B. Uh, you know, if it's, if Australia doesn't maintain its lucky country status and decides to fall for pitfalls, um, the St Kitts will be my bunker. It'd be my 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 place of refuge. Yeah, well, then clearly the whole, you know, citizenship by investment and all that stuff that we've uh, been hearing about is obviously uh, resonating and striking a chord with you. Not yet. And not only that, is there's so much potential with mining operations, which is extra revenue to the country. Man, if, if they said like, oh, you have to spend 200000 to investment, I would put it in like Bitcoin Cash Mining because they got this power project, this um, Theo, um, you know, geothermal power which is so much excess electricity i will i will put money into that project knowing that it's further going to secure the network and i've, I've done something for not only the community for myself but for the world um yeah i'm, I'm totally down <laughs> this is absolutely amazing and i just got to ask you then so what has been your what was your favorite talk from the conference i've i've, I've asked uh, quite a few people that so i'm interested on in your take I've actually got a few favourites. I've got... No, no, one favourite. One yeah. favourite? You've got to pick a heart. You can give an honourable mention uh, to one or two, but you've got to have the one favourite. All right. I'm going to go with the Zap It. Yeah, okay. Yeah. <laughs> let, me break, let me break this down, right? I've got 200 merchants in the Bitcoin Cash City. My, my focus right now is to create more retail spenders. Now, Zap It's got a program where it's like a 20, 25% rebate. If I can have that in my country, 
that is going to help me because a fluctuation who cares like it has to drop more than 25 percent you know what i mean before but you get, you've lost yeah yeah but you're getting a rebate you know what i mean and it's bitcoin cash so i can see myself plugging zap it i can see myself encouraging new suspendage because the one thing that's destroying the bitcoin cash movement in australia is this hodl mentality is I, i've tried so hard over the last 12 months to break this hodl mentality to buy it spend it stack it but it, it's like people are like locked they need a perception you know paradigm shift and i'm hoping with zap it um that i can do that absolutely amazing all right well we've got done nearly two hours of the uh podcast so <laughs> so we do have to uh wrap this up here but thank you for coming on the show and do you want to give some uh shout outs and uh where can people find you and we'll do the same for Rohit as well yeah i've got two youtube channels uh bitcoin cash city uh and bitcoin jason um i think i got handles now so it's at bitcoin cash city and at bitcoin jason yeah. uh and you'll find me there um i just want to say to the the audience Go and like and subscribe to every Bitcoin Cash um, con content creator like yourselves because if we all got to stand together or we hang separately. That's it. Uh, I love it. We'll have the uh, have the links in the thing. Rohit, do you want to give uh, any uh, shout outs or where can people find you? Obviously, we'll put uh, we'll put the information in the description as well. Uh, well, it's just, uh, it's either Romit Radical or Radical Romit, depending on the platform. Like okay. tw Twitter would be uh, Radical Romit. Okay. Uh, but mainly, I think, uh, zap it underscore IO everywhere. Than me, you can follow zap it for all the updates. Yeah, we'll link up to that. Okay, well, that will do it for the show. Uh, thank you very much to our live audience. Uh, that's super cool. We've never had that really before. So that's a new experience for me. <laughs> Great to see. Uh, Jet, yeah, producing that. Thank you to the uh, patrons, uh, Ricky and HP. Uh, check out BitcoinCashPodcast.com for the start guide, FAQs and links. Thank you to everybody listening on Podcash. And uh, yeah, Jet, do you have any uh, shout out you want to give? Surely there's got to be something after the whole conference. Oh, man. I guess just to, to everyone that, that made the conference happen, to everyone that I've met so far, uh, I feel like in my location it's pretty isolated and it, it, it like the the podcast is a way that I get news but seeing the spirit that everyone has here um, is just like it, it's it's lit an extra fire under my ass to really push things and so we're getting as much content as we can I'm gonna bring it back home see if I can get you know see if the feeling that I get from being here can be shared with with the locals where I'm from and see if we can push the same kind of adoption because Sonny is one guy and has gotten so much work done that I think if uh, all it takes is like a couple, I don't have all the time that Sonny has, but all it takes is a couple more people to get involved and we'll be on a, on a good path. Yeah, that's it. My shout out is the same. Just Sonny has absolutely crushed it. He's been amazing while we've been here. He's been great with absolutely everybody. He's brought in so much money and energy, you know, and Bitcoin Cash love to, to the country. And I'm sure that that's going to be uh, recognized he is just an absolute superstar you know possibly the number one most effective person in the bitcoin cash community uh right now which is is saying a lot you know so yeah thank you very much sunny and uh yeah thank you to all the listeners till next time the greatest story the world has ever known the rise and rise of bitcoin 2022 a single chance for the world, a single moment in time. Bankers capture us all, our cryptocurrency flies, gets to the side. Phoenix fly from the flame, Bitcoin BCH forever changing the game. An underdog story everyone trying to deny. Bitcoin revolution, crypto trade on the rise. Then they stole our brand name and tried to push us aside. Cause they said it was over, that we'd never survive. Maybe there was a world that was the end of the ride. But this kind of hero's journey is 